Welcome to the Sans Science Experience Podcast, where we explore the latest and most exciting papers and preprints in science. Before we deep dive into today's fascinating research, please take a moment to like, subscribe, and share this deep dive with your friends and family. Your support truly helps the Sans Science Experience bring you more of these explorations. Okay, so today we're tackling a really fundamental question about aging. Um, what happens when two seemingly powerful anti-aging strategies, you know, try to work together? And does one pathway maybe hold more sway than the other? We're diving into a really compelling paper by Shem Tov et al. from USC's School of Gerontology and their collaborators. Their work, well, it doesn't just describe things, it actually challenges our assumptions about how we might extend not just lifespan, but health span. Yeah, what makes this research so insightful, I think, is its focus on the interplay between two uh, critical pillars of aging. We're talking about insulin-like growth factor one signaling, IGF-1, and the integrity of our mitochondrial DNA. Now, individually, we know quite a bit about them. Reduce IGF-1 signaling, well, that's pretty established for extending lifespan, offering protection against uh, age-related diseases. And on the flip side, damage to mitochondrial DNA definitely accelerates aging and contributes to a lot of diseases. But how do these two powerful forces interact when you put them together? That's the, uh, the complex puzzle this paper starts to solve. Right. So our mission for this deep dive is to figure out if boosting one anti-aging mechanism can overcome a fundamental problem in another. Or maybe if there's a clear hierarchy, you know, kind of master control and aging that dictates whether our interventions work. This should give you a shortcut to understanding the surprising interactions between these, um, these key hallmarks of aging. So before we get to their findings, which are really interesting, let's set the scene a bit. Aging is complex. Right? Oh, absolutely. The paper grounds itself in this idea of interconnected hallmarks. Things like uh, genomic instability, our DNA getting messy mitochondrial dysfunction, you know, the cell's powerhouses starting to fail. Yeah, and deregulated nutrient sensing. Basically, our cells losing track of how to respond to food properly. And for a long time, scientists studied these individually. Mostly, yeah. But how they interact, well, that's remained pretty fuzzy, a bit of a black box. And that gap makes developing effective anti-aging strategies really challenging. Exactly. And if you think about IGF-1 signaling, picture it like a master conductor for growth and metabolism. When you turn that down, reduce IGF-1, you see big benefits. Mammalian lifespan can jump by about 35%. Plus, you get protection against things like neurodegeneration, heart disease. A powerful lever, then. Yeah, definitely. But then you have mitochondrial DNA instability. These tiny power plants, our mitochondria, have their own DNA. And when that DNA gets damaged, their function declines. It speeds up aging, leading to things like sarcopenia, muscle loss, and heart failure. So one pathway seems to slow aging. The other speeds it up. Right. And the crucial question Shimtov and colleagues asked was, what happens when these two forces collide? Do they work together, fight each other, or does one just dominate? Okay, so what were the specific possibilities they were considering? How did they think these pathways might interact? Well, they laid out a couple of main ideas. One possibility was that maybe they work, you know, in parallel, that the benefits of reducing IGF-1 could maybe compensate for or even help fix the damage from the mitochondrial mutations. Okay, that makes sense. The other possibility, which is maybe more intriguing, was that one pathway might be absolutely essential for the other to even work right. They really wanted to know if suppressing IGF-1 could counteract the bad effects of all those mitochondrial mutations. It's like asking if you can tune an engine for better gas mileage when the engine itself is falling apart. Precisely. A good analogy. So to figure this out, they needed some specific tools, these genetically modified mice. Can you walk us through those models? Absolutely. They use two really distinct mouse models. First, these Polkidae 257A mutator mice. These mice are engineered with an error-prone enzyme, DNA polymerase, that replicates their mitochondrial DNA. So it makes mistakes when copying mitochondrial DNA. Constantly. It causes mitochondrial DNA mutations to pile up incredibly fast. And the results are severe, a 40% shorter lifespan, place all sorts of age-related problems, muscle wasting, heart issues, anemia, inflammation. They basically age super fast. Wow. Okay, and the second model? The second model was PAPA deficient mice, or PAPA. The PAPA gene makes a protein that usually boosts active IGF-1. So by deleting this gene, they effectively lowered IGF-1 signaling. And in normal mice, that helps them live longer. That's right. In normal mice, deleting PAPA is a known longevity trick. Extends lifespan by about 35%. That's clever. So the key experiment was crossing them creating mutator mice that also had less PAPA, less IGF-1 signaling. Exactly. That was the core of it. Creating Polga 257A mice that were also PAPA or PAPA plus Cygnus, meaning one copy deleted. And the big question was, 
would the reduced IGF-1 still work its magic, extend life, even with all that mitochondrial damage? That was the hope, or at least the question. Could the longevity benefits of low IGF-1 overcome the accelerated aging from the mitochondrial mutations? The results? Well, they were quite revealing. Okay, I'm on the edge of my seat. What did they find regarding lifespan? Did lowering IGF-1 help the mutator mice live longer? This is where things got really interesting and, frankly, unexpected. The answer was no. Oh, at all? Not at all. The paper clearly showed that deleting the Papa gene, which usually extends lifespan, completely failed to extend the lifespan of the mitochondrial mutator mice. Wow. And it gets worse. In some cases, the pulled 8257A mice with Papa deleted actually showed enhanced frailty and more weight loss as they got older. That's incredible. So instead of helping, it might have even made some things worse in the long run. It certainly didn't deliver the expected benefit and pointed towards potential negative interactions under severe mitochondrial stress. This really suggests there's a hierarchy we might have missed. So what does that tell us right away about how these aging factors relate? It's a pretty profound finding. It strongly suggests that the pro-longevity effects we see from suppressing IGF-1 really depend on the basic health of the mitochondrial genome. It's like mitochondrial mutations impose a hard limit a ceiling on lifespan. A ceiling that overrides other beneficial signals. Exactly, a foundational issue. And importantly, this isn't just a one-off finding. Other studies using these mutator mice also found that things like calorie restriction, exercise, even antioxidant treatments failed to extend their lifespan. So if the core energy system is broken. Then many of the other well-known longevity strategies just don't seem to gain traction. The foundation needs to be solid. Okay, so lifespan extension was a bust. But was it all negative? Did they see any improvements in health span, you know, the, the quality of life? Ah, now that's where the story takes a different turn. Yes, absolutely. While lifespan wasn't extended, deleting Papa did significantly lessen a whole range of age-related problems in the mutator mice. Okay, that's crucial. So improvements in health, even if not in length of life. Precisely. This points to real benefits in health span, which is arguably just as important. Can you give some examples? What specific health aspects improved? Sure. For instance, spleen enlargement, or splenomegaly, which is common in these mice, was rescued by papa deletion. Both full and partial deletion helped. And interestingly, the partial deletion, the heterozygous papa plus mice, actually helped restore red blood cell levels and hemoglobin. It rescued the anemia they usually get. That's a concrete physiological improvement? Definitely tangible benefits. And I remember reading about some sex-specific effects. Were the improvements different in males and females? Yes, that was another key detail. Male mutator mice tend to have high levels of inflammatory markers like IL-2 and IL-6, classic signs of inflammation. Heterozygous papa deletion significantly brought those down in males. But not in females. Females seem to have a mild inflammatory profile to begin with in this model, and the papa deletion didn't really change it. Suggest different vulnerabilities, different responses between sexes. Fascinating. What about muscle and heart health? Those are huge for aging well. Absolutely critical. And again, improvements were seen mostly in males. Male Palgay D257A mice with partial papa deletion showed better grip strength and endurance, better muscle function. And the heart. Male mutator mice often get an enlarged heart, thicker ventricle walls, things that mimic age-related heart disease in humans. Papa deletion, both partial and full, significantly improved these heart dimensions in males better cardiac structure. It's really striking that often the partial deletion seemed better than the full deletion. What's the thinking there? Yeah, the heterozygous Papa Plus often gave the best results. It hints at a sort of Goldilocks effect. Maybe fully suppressing IGF-1 is too much, especially when the mitochondria are already struggling. A partial reduction might hit a sweet spot, giving benefits without causing other problems. So dose matters, especially under stress. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It highlights the need for careful calibration in these kinds of interventions. Okay, so recapping. No lifespan extension, but definite health span improvements. How? If Papa deletion didn't fix the underlying mutations, how did it improve health? What was the mechanism? Right. That's the crucial question they tackled next. They looked deep into the cells. And critically, they confirmed Papa deletion did not change how often the mitochondrial DNA mutations occurred. The mistakes were still happening, and it didn't change the amount of mitochondrial DNA either. So the source of the problem wasn't fixed. The damage was still being generated, but maybe its impact was lessened. Precisely. That's where it gets really clever. What Papa deletion did achieve was slowing down the clonal expansion of the harmful mutations within the cells. Clonal expansion. 
meaning the mutated mitochondria taking over. Exactly. Think of it like this. A mutation happens in one mitochondrion or cell. Normally, maybe that damaged version replicates faster or survives better and eventually takes over, causing dysfunction. Papa dilution seemed to put the brakes on that takeover process. So it's not preventing the initial spark, but it's stopping the wildfire from spreading through the cell or tissue. That's a great analogy. It contains the damage, prevents it from overwhelming the system, and that helped preserve mitochondrial function enough to improve heart health and other aspects. Biological containment. And presumably, you could see evidence of this containment at the gene expression level. They did. Using transcriptomics, looking at which genes are turned on or off, they saw PAPA deletion started to normalize the gene activity in the hearts of the mutator mice. Genes linked to heart disease, inflammation, metabolic stress, they were shifted back towards healthier levels. So the heart was coping better. Yes, and it involved improvements in key heart muscle genes and a kind of metabolic reprogramming, making the heart more flexible in how it used fuel. And they mentioned something called context-dependent metabolic rewiring. What does that mean? Right, that was another fascinating layer. It means certain metabolic changes only happen when you had both the mitochondrial mutations and the partial PAPA dilution together. Not in either condition alone. Correct. For example, Specific genes for handling fats, lipid metabolism, storage, mobilization, were turned up only in the mutator mice with partial PAPA deletion. It shows that these aging hallmarks don't just add up. Their interaction can create entirely new biological states and responses, really complex. Which brings us back to the big puzzle. If health span improved, why didn't lifespan follow? Why were those longevity programs blocked? That's the crux of it. The paper argues pretty compellingly that the POLG8257 allele, the mutator gene itself, essentially blocked or severely blunted the core anti-aging programs that PAPA dilution normally activates. You mean the standard benefits you see in healthy mice when you lower IGF-1? Exactly. Think about that cascade. Lower MTOR signaling, better telomere maintenance, boosted DNA repair, improved protein quality control, proteostasis, healthier chromatin. All the good stuff. All the good stuff. In normal mice, deleting PAPA helps switch these on. But in the mutator mice, these crucial pathways just didn't engage properly. Any specific examples of pathways that failed to activate? Yeah, they mentioned ATP-dependent chaperones, for example. These are proteins crucial for proteostasis, for keeping other proteins folded correctly. They need energy, ATP. In the mutator mice, these chaperones were downregulated, likely because the damaged mitochondria couldn't produce enough ATP. And PAPA deletion couldn't rescue that. So even if the signal, low IGF-1, was there, the cell didn't have the energy or the machinery wasn't working right to actually carry out the anti-aging program. That seems to be the key insight. It suggests a definite hierarchy. The basic integrity of the mitochondrial genome looks like a prerequisite. It needs to be reasonably functional for these other longevity pathways to kick in effectively. If that foundation is crumbling. Then even beneficial signals from upstream, like low IGF-1, can't fully launch the downstream programs needed for lifespan extension. The signal gets sent, but the receiver is broken or unpowered. Okay, so wrapping this up, what are the main takeaways for us, for anyone interested in aging research or longevity? Well, I think the big message is that targeting just one hallmark of aging might not be the silver bullet we hope for, especially if a more fundamental hallmark like mitochondrial health is already seriously compromised. So interventions like fiddling with nutrient-sensing pathways, IGF-1, they might fail or maybe even backfire if mitochondrial damage is severe. That's what this study strongly suggests. It really forces us to think more holistically. It sounds like we need a much more integrated model of aging now. Absolutely. We have to consider the complex interactions, the hierarchies, the potential failure points between these different hallmarks. Future treatments, these geroprotectors, they need to be tested in models that reflect this complexity models with multiple aging issues combined, not just one thing wrong. To see how they really perform in a more realistic aging scenario. Exactly. To understand their true scope and limitations, it's about building robust, maybe multi-pronged strategies that address the core issues. So here's a final thought to leave you with, something to maybe chew on. We saw that mitochondrial DNA mutations seemed to set this hard limit on lifespan, and reducing IGF-1 didn't stop the mutations from happening, but it did slow down their clonal expansion, how they spread and take over. So maybe, maybe a key strategy for preserving health span, even if we can't prevent the initial damage, lies in finding better ways to just contain that damage to slow the spread of harmful mutations within our cells and tissues. Less about preventing the first hit, more about effective damage control and containment afterwards. 
that could really change how we approach interventions. That's a wrap on this deep dive into the fascinating and sometimes counterintuitive interplay of aging hallmarks. We really hope you gained some valuable insights from this incredible research. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the Sand Science Experience for more exciting explorations into the world of science.